How's it going? Um, as seen by this title, I'm going to talk to you about uh, a little bit of Electron, a little bit of Rust, and like a lot of highlighted WASM. Um, so I hope you're in for it. Uh, this talk is about something I built and I was able to put into an Electron, um, aka the browser application, and I've been able to put it to production, and the stories about how I did it, and all the things that did not go so well, and all the things that went really well. Um, and all the things in between. Um, so I hope you're gonna enjoy this little story. Um, all right, so this is the application I work on. It's called Compass. It's a uh, GUI for MongoDB. It lets you kind of look into your collections, into your documents, and aggregate a few things, and do everything in between so you don't have to use the shell. Uh, this particular tab is uh, the tab that uh, has a backend that analyzes a schema, um, and that's the tab that I rewrote in Rust and compiled down to Wasm. Um, and the performance improvements that I got out of it were actually really, really big, um, which is why I'm giving this talk, because I'm really proud of the work I've done, and uh, it didn't come very easy, but it wasn't very hard, and I wanted to maybe make it a little bit easier for everybody else. Um, hi, I'm Irina. Um, I write JavaScript and Rust, I guess now, at MongoDB. Um, I started writing Rust about eight months ago, um, and I've been writing JavaScript before then. Um, yeah. So um, you might also know me from my zines. Uh, my works include, <laughs> my works <laughs> include the, um, the JavaScript event loop zine that I've recently done for Queer.js in Berlin. Um, I've also done a trade zine for RustFest in Rome. Um, I've also made a Rust async zine for this conference, so if you got a chance to snatch one, great. If you didn't, I think I'm out. Um, Cool. Uh, I'm, I grew up in Vancouver in Canada, not too far away from here, and I write behavior with a U. <laughs> Sometimes I say A. <laughs> I, I don't do the, like the about that the east coast of Canada does, but maybe sometimes it comes out. Uh, <laughs> sorry, it did come out. <laughs> um, I currently live in Berlin, though. Um, a little bit further away. So I, I'm, I've been here, I've been in Portland for about six days and I'm still very jet lagged. Um, but that's another story. Um, I also have two cats. Uh, this one's Chasho, you might have seen her already. Um, she's very good, she's a really good cat. Um, that's Chasho, and the other cat's Naughty and she's also like a really good cat uh, that goes for walks, that's Naughty, and that's like the two of them together. Yeah, so that was a brief interlude and now we're back to Rust and Wasm. Uh, <laughs> I hope that was a good interlude. Uh, so, kind of like another brief thing before this talk. Um, this talk comes from a point of view of a JavaScript developer writing Rust. Um, I will focus mostly on Wasm. I'll do like a little bit of a Rust thing, but um, you're a Rust developer, so I, 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 I'm not gonna like teach you about Rust, because I, I would assume that I'd be talking down. <laughs> um, so yeah, so this is kind of the thing of a talk. We've got a bit of an agenda. Uh, that we'll go through. Uh, so this, not a class, but a little bit of a class. So we'll talk a little bit about how schema analysis happens in Compass, aka the application I work on. Uh, we'll go through a little bit of that and how that happens and kind of what are the requirements of how um, the Rust portion of things will progress. Um, we'll talk about why we kind of went with the Rust solution and a WASM solution, or the WASM solution and then a Rust solution, depending on which way you're looking at it. Um, and then uh, there's going to be a story of the Rust and the Wasm and the JavaScript, which also sounds like a little story that starts. So the Rust and the Wasm and the JavaScript went to a ramen shop and they got three bowls of tomkotsu. Uh, <laughs> but I, I don't know. <laughs> maybe they didn't, maybe they did. Um, we'll talk about all of the three, whether or not they got the bowl of tomkotsu or not. So we'll start with the schema analysis in Compass. Um, as I showed you, the tab kind of looks like this, um, and what it does is it helps us look into a um, collection. It queries some documents from the collection. It doesn't do the whole thing, but it queries some of them um, and analyzes them to basically help users to detect outliers in their applications. Um, it doesn't do the whole thing, but kind of just a brief overview of what happens. Uh, but I think the best way to kind of see what it does is to actually 
go and look at it. So we'll do that um, as a little brief demo because it's kind of cool. The lag is ridiculous. <laughs> Uh, all right, so I, I have a little collection uh, of um, Berlin cocktail bars. This talk also functions as like, uh, come to Berlin, explore Berlin. <laughs> we've, um, we've, the team uh, and I have curated a list of like really good bars in Berlin. They're like hand-picked and have hand-tested. Um, <laughs> Uh, there's a bunch of, it, it's only about 21 of them, so uh, as you can tell from here. Uh, so it's not too many. Um, so pretty small schema, but what the schema tab does is it looks into it and then analyzes it. Um, and there's a bunch of different information that you can get. Uh, because the sample is so small, we, don't, we, don't, we just go through the entire collection. It's under 1,000 documents. And then we can um, tell what the data kind of looks like. So in this particular um, uh, field, house number, so the house number, um, it comes in two different uh, kind of types. So there's an integer 32 type and a double type, um, which probably shouldn't be there, but I don't know who inserted it for the purpose of a demo, but they did. Um, <laughs> and you can kind of look into and see what the data looks like. Um, there's also a map you can work with. Um, but again, kind of gives you an overview of what your data is like, and then you can work with it pretty well and kind of give you some insights as to what to do with it later. Um, you can also analyze based on um, particular aspects of that. So uh, we kind of just um, selected a document that's in this postal code range, uh, Peltzer's postal code. Um, there's only one, and it's Mr. Susan. That's a good one. Uh, actually, that's a good one. I, that was not intentional. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's what the tab does. And now I'll go back to the slides. And so the whole application is built. It's a JavaScript application. It's run in Electron which is basically a cross-platform browser you can install on, like, like you can build an application and install it on Windows or Linux or um, what's this computer, OS X, <laughs> um, and, and work on a bunch of different uh, cross-platforms. But you write it in JavaScript, which is really nice. And uh, we compile it down with Webpack and we usually write React. So basically like what everybody does, we also do. Um, and for some of the visualizations, we write um, D3. So all of it's like JavaScript stack. Um, it's built on MongoDB because uh, it's a MongoDB uh, GUI. <laughs> um, so it kind of works like that. Um, but the portion that does the schema uh, looks into two different things. It works with a collection sample that samples the collection and looks for about um, 1,000 documents. And then there is a schema parser, and MongoDB schema is that parser. And what it does is it analyzes the database. Um, kind of works like that. So first you sample, and then you pass it on to the parser and get all that uh, accumulated data about the thing. Um, in JavaScript, um, first we've got to connect to the MongoDB client. Um, then we sample, and then we pipe. It's a stream in JavaScript, and we parse it. Um, and we get a little bit of uh, accumulated data back that we'll have to then replicate it in Rust. And what this data looks like is that it's a accumulation of all the fields and the information about them. So for example, we get like a little count saying how many fields we got in that particular field type, which is website. Um, and then we can get like a total count, so not all the documents have a website based on the fact that total count is 21 and the website field is 17. Um, and that's kind of what we can infer afterwards um, in the visual aspect of it. And then we get like field types. So in this particular case, um, we can see that some of them are undefined because uh, three of them do not, or four of them do not have a um, website at all and uh, the rest of them do. So kind of all that information works in JavaScript and then will have to be put back into Wasm or Rust. So, and then I kind of showed it to you and it works really well. Um, and I've gave you all the good stuff, but so then why are we rewriting it in Rust? Um, the thing, the reason why we're writing it in Rust is because we can only function with about a thousand documents at a time. 
Um, and as soon as we want to increase, or we want to give a better view of the collections to people who use this thing, um, it gets rather slow. So if we're looking um, for something a little bit more and we want to do like a progressive collection scan or we want to, again, just sample more than a thousand documents, it gets really, really slow. So the example for this is if you want to parse a pretty nested um, set of documents, a pretty nested collection, 10,000 documents takes a really long period of time. Um, and so we want to optimize somehow and we want to not like get a bunch of JIRA tickets saying the thing is slow. Um, so there's a bunch of different ways that like we can go about um, optimizing it. Uh, one of them is you know putting this in a web worker and maybe offloading some of the computation. Uh, okay, maybe some of our types are not wrong and we can be a little bit better about the way we've actually written. Uh, and there's like something about TypeScript maybe uh, that could do that for you. Um, but I guess at that point, we'd just rather be writing Rust. Um, and I mean, there's a bunch of like dark arts with the V8 one can perform and also get a bunch of speed up. But um, again, be, you don't particularly need to do the dark arts and a bunch of really smart people actually wrote this parser and it's already very well written. So what else can we do? Um, and you know, oh good mother, there's a metal more attractive, uh, the web assembly. Um, and so we kind of thought about this and a lot of different, you know, there's blogs about how good it is and what there's blogs about how fast it is and all these things that are kind of interesting about it. So we thought that maybe we can also do the WASM and uh, write the parser in WASM and actually speed it up that way. Um, it gets us an opportunity to be able to kind of explore a new um, domain. It gets us an opportunity to speed something up that without, does, without performing the dark arts um, and just trying something else out. Um, so what's WASM? Uh, WASM is a low level assembly language that compiles down to something else, uh, compiles down from something else. Uh, in the case that we've chosen, it's uh, Rust. Uh, it uh, looks, <laughs> if you look into the network tab, it looks like this. Uh, uh, rather, actually, pretty good art. <laughs> Um, so again, it compiles down from something else and gives us the performance boost that we kind of liked. So this, these are the numbers for a pretty nested set of documents and there's about a thousand of them, but uh, if we look down into like even a larger sample, it speeds up even more, um, which is pretty darn fast. And so we liked it a lot. Um, and the essential thing that it lets us do is be able to have native code in the browser and obviously does the job that it's meant to do. And we did not have to kind of go out of our way to make it fast. It just kind of came with the Rust thing, which is cool. Um, right, so um, the way it works is that we've got the Rust and the Compass, which is our browser, and it just communicates through the WASM side of things. And voila, all right. So now we're gonna talk a little bit about the Rust. I'm doing it again, aren't I? It's a bad thing, <laughs> now that I mentioned it. <laughs> um, so I'm not gonna go in too much into about the Rust, but we'll talk about a little bit how we made this application work. Um, so we start off with the Compass, and the Compass will still do the whole talking and the collection sampling. Um, however many documents it needs. It'll talk to the database. The database will return a bunch of documents that we've sampled, and then we'll want to talk to the Rust, um, and the Rust will then compile it onto the WASM, and the WASM will then talk to Compass, and then Compass will talk to the WASM, and the WASM will talk to Rust. It's a lot of communication going on. It's a very, like, very commu communicative set of tools that we've ended up here. And so the Rust TLDR is actually just here as a little brief story of the number of things that did not work out as a person who's never written a Rust-like language. Um, it's a story of quite a few errors, and there's like a lot of them, um, like so many of them. <laughs> uh, and there was a lot of existential Googling along the way as well. <laughs> Uh, 
Um, but it turned out well. It's a happy story. And I think one of the reasons why it's a happy story is because Rust came with a bunch of help that you don't usually just come built in in, um, in uh, JavaScript. And there's quite a few characters that are just there, and they're there and happy to help you. Um, right, so how this works, we'll skip the wasm part for a moment. Compass wants to talk to Rust, Rust wants to talk to Compass, and all we wanted to do is Rust needs to accept a bunch of documents that come through, needs to parse those documents, accumulate the information, and send the cumul cumulative um, info back. Um, and to kind of get this to work, the first thing that I thought I would do is just start with a string, because string is the easiest thing to understand, uh, and that's the type that's so easy to work with. So <laughs> we started off with just writing a string and returning a string, and I think that worked rather well. The compiler was really happy. I liked it a lot. There is some um, art in between uh, that I received back, but overall, good, good, good story. Um, so we were accepting a string, but the one thing we then kind of thought of is that, well, we're working with a MongoDB uh, set of documents, uh, which means we were working with something called Bison. How many of you know Bison? Oh, good, okay. <laughs> I wasn't sure, just in case, but if, in case you don't know, um, we want to do the same thing, it just has to be in Bison. Uh, and I, I like this definition, in case you, lots of you know, um, basically, same thing as JSON. Um, comes with uh, the way to pronounce it, this definition. Um, but it comes with, it's same as JSON, it just has a few different types that we'd have to handle differently, um, like decimal 128 or min max keys or bin data and things like that. So just have to work with that. But fortunately, there's already a crate that um, Zoni E2 have uh, written um, for us that we just used and it worked really nicely. Um, the only thing you have to do is we still accept a string um, for now, uh, <laughs> but just convert it into a BSON document and then able to extract all the appropriate information that's not just a string out of that and then work with it, which is really cool. So then that gets us to like the number situation um, as like another struggle of a JavaScript developer in Rust. Uh, this is the only number type available in JavaScript. It's very good. <laughs> this is the number types available in Rust. <laughs> so as a JavaScript developer, when you get into this, it's a, it's a bit confusing. Um, so picking a number type was a bit of a challenge for a JavaScript developer in Rust. Um, I only ever needed like two fields, but I spent like a lot of time debating on what numbers to choose. And to the point where I, like, I made a flowchart of <laughs> what number should I choose to be able to do this properly. Um, and so out of all these numbers that you know, I had to choose from, I actually just went with the U size. <laughs> um, cool. And then the next set of things that was like errors. Um, how do you do errors? Can I just do a type error and be okay with it? Um, and then I, I was reading a bunch of stuff and um, everybody said, you have to do this. And it seems like a lot. <laughs> um, and so I was kind of thought about this and then I found a crate and the crate was really good. So instead of having to write all of that, I just did this. <laughs> and that was great. I kind of like this part of Rust. That was good. <laughs> um, so yeah, I just converted everything from failure error. I could use the question mark operator. Unwrap has to be there. I don't ask questions. It's just in that particular way, it has to be. I don't know. It just wouldn't compile otherwise. Um, and obviously, like, I don't, I don't have to tell you that data ownership in Rust is, uh, is uh, good and bad at the same time, and sometimes you've got to fight with the borrow checker quite a bit. Um, like here, or I, for some reason, this is the only screenshot I had, but I had so many problems with this. Um, and the one conclusion I kind of came up with uh, at the end of this all is that it's just always right, and <laughs> just don't fight with it. <laughs> Um, but the TL TLDR that I've kind of got to at this point, in st at this stage of kind of writing this um, code, is that it helps Rust helps you write performant code, and you don't have to kind of do anything special. You don't have to do anything out of the ordinary. You don't have to do any magic, and you kind of just end up with clean code um, right off the bat. Cool. So this particular portion of uh, 
my work is available at MongoDB REST, MongoDB Schema Parser, and it's a schema parser that lets you do the stuff. Uh, but that's the REST side of things. Uh, let's talk about the WASM a little bit, aka the juicy part. <laughs> All right, hello. <laughs> um, there's a bunch of different definitions for WASM that I got on the internet. One of them is from me. It's faster than JavaScript is the way I've defined it. Uh, <laughs> um, but to kind of like the nice um, a conglomerated definition I liked is um, it's a low-level assembly-like language um, with a compact binary format uh, that provides languages with a compilation target so they can run on the web. And kind of the main part of that is that it's a compilation target. Um, and that's the cool thing. So you can kind of get WASM from other different languages. Uh, you don't have to write Rust. Uh, I just chose to write Rust. Uh, I know the Go logo is no longer that. I just really like the Gopher, so I kept the Gopher. <laughs> um, right, so we wrote Rust, can compile from, from anything else. Um, it just compiles down to WASM, and WASM is what we talk to. Um, we don't talk to Rust directly. Um, right, so a compilation target. So how do we get to the compilation target? Well, there's luckily a really convenient tool that lets you do that. It's called Wasm BindGen, and that's what we did as well. So I've written kind of like the Rust code, and the Rust code had the API, and then we wanted to be able to use it in JavaScript. Um, so Wasm BindGen kind of generated the things that we could use in JavaScript, and one of them is the Wasm file, which is you know the art that we saw previously, and then the bindings.js file, which is the JavaScript that we can use inside our code. And to be able to kind of get all of this, um, all we have to do is just annotate with Wasm BindGen. Um, and because uh, we want uh, you know, the JavaScript coworkers to be happy, we just kind of use um, the JS uh, custom names, so the new or the right JSON without the underscore, because that gets confusing when you're in JavaScript land. Um, so it's good. Um, when you start off writing Wasm, you kind of just end up with three different things you can use. You can use the error, you can use the value, and you can use like a, a borrowed string. Uh, or, or, so that, those are the kind of things that ended up in the beginning, and it's a really good thing because I started off with a string uh, to make the compiler happy, which is really good. So all I had to do is just keep what I had and return a JS value or return a string, and that worked, sort of. Um, let's compile and see what happens. <laughs> Spoiler alert, I guess a little bit. <laughs> um, it didn't compile right away, and uh, it was kind of interesting, this error that came through. And what it was telling me is the error that I was using was not working, um, which means the failure error solution I have tried to use because I thought I was being really clever did not actually work. And before you tell me you should have used the box, <laughs> the box also doesn't work. <laughs> um, so an interesting way of actually handling this is that I had a specific wrapper that worked in Rust and a specific wrapper that worked in JavaScript. So all I did was I wrapped my Rust methods and my WASM exported methods and matched on the result type, and whenever I got an error, I just stringified it into a JS value. And that worked, and that works really well. Um, can do the same here. Um, thankfully, we're also not the only people who were struggling with this. There is an open um, PR on this issue as well, so you can check it out and follow it there as well. Um, cool, so started off with a string, kind of worked for us, it's good. Um, we've got um, Compass talking to um, the database, receiving documents, talking to Wasm, Wasm talking to Rust, um, but what we're kind of need to think about is the fact that we're getting BSON documents coming through from the database, we're stringifying them and then sending them to Wasm, and then what happens when you stringify is you actually lose a bunch of data integrity, because um, what BSON does is that it specifies when something is decimal 128, it specifies when something is bin data, so whenever you stringify all of that, you actually lose it. Um, so something we had to think about is that how do we make this work um, otherwise? So what the idea came is that, okay, so we have the node driver returning raw BSON. 
Um, what if we just send that raw, instead of like serializing on JavaScript side of things, deserializing on the Rust side of things, so we can skip all that serializing and deserializing steps and just pass around raw BSON. That was a cool idea. Um, and, but that requires us to send a VEC, basically, like you need a VEC of sorts. And how do you do that when I just told you that the only thing we can use is error, value, and string? Are we stuck again? We're not. And why we're not stuck is because there's a crate that's kind of attached to us in PineGen called JSSys. And what that does is it lets you have a bunch of ROM bindings to JavaScript APIs that you can use in Rust. And a bunch of them are, there's like a very long list, uh, but some of them will include uh, object and function and you int eight array and date and iterators and things like that. But what we're interested in, because we're starting off with a raw buffer, which is technically a vector, which is technically a uint8 array, we can use a uint8 array for that. Um, so what we do is that we accept a uint8 array, and then uh, we do some magic in between, and then we just basically decode a BSON document that comes up with the correct type of data information, aka a decimal 128 comes in as a decimal 128 in its proper uh, glory of decimal 128 and precision, um, and we don't lose any data. Um, and basically what it does is that... <laughs> <laughs> How much toilet humor can I get away with? <laughs> basically what you're able to do is then you just take um, the, the data that comes in from JavaScript heap and then convert it to the WASM linear memory and then just use it as part of WASM linear memory inside your Rust code. Um, and the magic in between is actually kind of interesting, so I'm gonna go back to that magic in between I, I said before. Uh, these are the things, if you ever pass in anything, it doesn't have to be just a U and 8 array, just like any kind of array buffer or anything that's in a vector in JavaScript and has to be like sort of a vector in um, Rust. Um, you gotta force it to be um, a mutable slice to be able to get it through to whatever code you're trying to do. A little bit of magic. Cool. So error handling. I kind of said that uh, we would work with like a string and we just return a string that's a JS value, but you can be a little bit more granular with it, also with a JS syscrate. And what we can do is we can specify the types of errors. So we can do a type error and we can create it and format it and get it to that particular state. Um, and there's like, a bunch of different ones. You could do a type, eval, range, syntax, reference, all the types of JavaScript things you want, you can get them. Um, so then, like, the next thing is, like, how do you debug WASM in your Rust or in your JavaScript? And that's kind of where it gets interesting. Um, it's, it's, a, it's, again, a story of a lot of whoopses. <laughs> so the number one thing is, like, a runtime error that you get. And then what that comes through is, let's hope this GIF works. Yes, it does, okay. Um, so what you get is, you get this kind of error, but you point to the part of your JS bindings. And what that does is it takes you to where that JS binding is causing the error, um, and you can get it through that. So it gets a little bit of tr tracking that you can follow through. Um, you can also get another whoops, um, and this one will come through as an error that you would throw. Um, this one through because I threw it on the JavaScript side of things because I wanted to throw it in the JavaScript side of things. Um, and again, you can kind of follow that through as well. Um, it starts off with a, a wasn't bind gen rethrow. Um, and you can follow that as well, which does not give you very useful information. Um, the wasm unnamed um, also does not give you very useful information. <laughs> But the next one, which is the two object call, which is one of my API calls, kind of gets you to that. And you can kind of figure out that it's one of these API methods that it throws for you. Um, but sometimes you get errors that like make no sense. Um, and this one is the one I didn't prepare for. This is like an actual error that I got. And for people in the back of the room, um, it said this. So um, it threw in my two object method. Um, on line 210, um, which I kind of sort of knew about, but I only have three API methods and they're like all wrappers because uh, guests were coming over and I just shoved 
everything else in like the drawers and I only exposed three API methods to follow through. And so this error was not very useful for me because there is like a bunch of code that's hidden under the two object. Um, and what it said is that there is like a recursive use of an object detected which would lead to unsafe aliasing in Rust what? <laughs> It was rather confusing. And so I went and searched for this error and I got a borrow fail um, somewhere in Wasm bind gen. But I did not get this anywhere throughout my code. I kind of compiled fine in the Rust side of things. And so I went a little bit deeper and it turns out um, it happens on the ref cell side of things. And I kind of went into this code a little bit later on. Um, I took a brief break from this and I was like, where was I using ref cell? That seems like very advanced magic that I should not have been touching. Um, <laughs> and so it was a little bit confusing. That was not intentional. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it was not like the kinds of things I wanted. And it, what it turned out to be is that I had an unimplemented um, call of for something that I was not meant to use and I was hitting that case, which is, you know, you shouldn't probably leave unimplemented code in your code. Like, you should probably implement it. <laughs> but it took a little bit of time to get through to that. Um, and obviously, like, only having three API methods exposed, it's kind of hard to debug. Um, and so, this is entirely a little bit unrelated. I wrote this um, pretty printer called FEM. It's for the log crate and it pretty prints um, your log uh, stuff for you. And unrelated to Wasm, I got a Wasm PR that makes it work in Wasm. And so I kind of put it into my code to see what it would do once I got that Wasm PR in, and I actually got line numbers, and there was like line numbers everywhere. <laughs> so I can see where like a bunch of my code that I was logging was coming through in a particular VS side of things. And it was really cool. I was very happy with that. So every time I'll do unimplemented in my like I'm hacking on this code, I'm just gonna use like them and <laughs> just log it like that so then I get a little bit of line numbers and don't have to like think about the API objects I've exposed. Cool, so then we build again and then we get a whoops again and I wonder what it would be now and it turns out something I was using was using libc. And that's an interesting thing because I'm not using libc. I know that I shouldn't be using libc, but one of my dependencies um, further down was using libc. And it was the bsun crate. But the nice thing about that is that you can do a little bit of config tags um, that would compile a certain way for Wasm and compile another way for Rust um, that I was able to use um, like that. Uh, fortunately, this actually got written down entirely because this was making um, object ID uh, the way that object ID is no longer specified, so I didn't even have to do that, but um, just so you know, uh, lots of your dependencies could be using libc, and we gotta be like, beware of libc when we compile down to wasm. Cool, so we kinda got to this um, wasm uh, generated, wasm bind gen generated code that we can use in our JavaScript application. Um, so let's look at the JavaScript. Um, this one's a really short section, so we'll just quickly go through it, because once we get to JavaScript, it's nice. Um, so we get to JavaScript, and we use something called wasmpack. How many of you have heard of wasmpack? Cool, sweet, so it makes it really easy. Uh, so you can just npm install the whole thing, and it just works. Um, the one caveat with it is it got to load async, and it has to come from like a little bit of a process, but Thankfully, if you load async, it sort of works, um, except the one whoops, and it's the webpack. <laughs> and after a bunch of like research and struggling with it, like a lot of struggling with it, um, you get to the point where you just have to install a very specific version of webpack, and then it just works. <laughs> um, and then to load it async, you just need like a dynamic import in Babel, and ba-dum. Um, Cool, so we had to adjust kind of like this flow a little bit for Electron, we skipped the middle step and we just require it async. And it looks like this, you import, and then you do a promise on the WASM module, and then you use it as is. Um, and the last part of thing is, yeah, actually using it. Um, 
So the API is, has three points. One is just using the new, kind of instantiating the module. And then every time there is data that comes through, we write it to the parser. And obviously the rest side of things stores it inside the schema parser. And then once we're done, we call either a to JSON or to object to be able to get all of that data accumulated. And it works really darn fast. Cool, so the TLDR. Um, the TLDR is that I did not have to do anything fancy to be able to get really fast code running in the browser. Um, I just kind of came with it. It came with the Rust side of things. Um, Rust compiles down to WebAssembly, and WebAssembly is really cool. Um, you don't have to, as Nick has stated, <laughs> you don't have to get a bunch of speed without um, doing the dark arts, um, and Rust and Wasm are there to be able to do that for you. Um, I, I wanted, I did want to say that it was hard. It was a hard like six months that it took me to like build out the whole thing. Um, but it was actually like a lot of fun um, to be able to do it. Um, right, so our compass now talks to rest and that's how we got it to do it. Thanks so much for listening. Thank you.